Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, so the the whole point of this talk is, um, oh, someone else. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to give you sort of a basis of gliding weather. Um, hopefully, um, you'll get a couple of bits that you didn't already know from this. Um, most of it is orientated at flying out of Wormingford specifically, uh, and how to sort of set your flights up to to get more success, whether that be local flying or going off and doing some cross country flying. So, so uh, I'll start off with sort of the basics of how I check the weather every morning. Um, I sort of developed this over a couple of years of doing cross country flying, seeing what works and what doesn't. So I sort of condensed it down into only a few um, different websites I check. Um, so everyone has their own preferences of what weather they use um, and each their own, I guess. But I found that these are the most useful for me. Um, so the, the one thing that I like to do is check the weather briefly in the evening and then check it in the morning. Um, and you can get a lot from that of how um, uncertain the forecast is. Um, I'm sure you've looked at the forecast on the previous evening. And I said the condition is going to be fantastic. You know, you can do 300 kilometers quite easily. And then you check in the morning and it's completely gone to rubbish. It's overdevelopment all day. And it's not even worth getting the glider out. So it's definitely worth checking both. Um, I mean, for gliding, over, things like overdevelopment, top cover, how quickly a cold front sweeps through. These are all very sensitive um, sort of parameters to look at. Um, and they change very quickly on like every weather app. So uh, it's worth checking every model update. So I'm going to go on to Chrome. Can you see my Chrome display? Yes. So um, I don't know how useful this is going to be because obviously it's right in the middle of winter. But uh, if I was going to start my forecasting, I'd go into viewers, which is the most local Met Office um, like town to look at. And this just gives like a very general overview of what the weather's going to be doing. Um, it's quite nice to, to use this just as a basis um, to see what, you know, what days are looking nice, what sort of weather band, you know, if there's a week of sunny weather, then you need to look out for some potential good gliding days. Uh, and then I go to the surface pressure chart and I find this really really useful because this is like the basics of me you know looking at the map is looking at the pressure chart um so right now we've got quite an intense area of high pressure um I mean obviously in the summer you'd be looking for a building high from the west um so a low pressure system to just sweep through maybe a cold front to have come through. Uh, and then a building high is exactly what you're looking for. As I mean, you can see here, uh, this is ridging. So where the isobars uh, spread out um, and become really spaced out across the UK, that's exactly what we look for. Um, it makes it really good for cross country flying because there's not much wind around. So if you're in a, if you're in a low performance glider, um, it's perfect really. So, and then I go on to Sky Sight. Uh, so I've loaded up Australia because I, I don't know if you've been keeping up to date with the weather, but they've got an event called La Nina this year, which is where okay. they've got quite extreme flooding across the north east of the country, um, which makes it sort of dampened down to almost UK conditions. I mean, I'll show you what the rain's been for the last 72 hours. So got really intense areas of rain. Um, so there's a lot of flooding going on. Um, and a lot of the reports I've been getting on Facebook is that the cloud base is at 3,000, 4,000 feet. Lots of overdevelopment seems a lot like the UK. So um, if I was going to look at sky site on a cross country day, first thing I'd look at is the potential flight distance. So this is for today, and it's saying we've 
well fantastic conditions across the country really but one thing to bear in mind um when you look at these parameters is um to make sure you read the box on the bottom left it gives you a good description uh and you can be easily misled if you don't read this so the potential flight distance as a definition is um the distance you can fly given you take off when the first thermal pops off and you stay flying and doing a cross-country flight until the very last thermal at the airfield so um yeah it's kind of misleading because you could see 700 kilometers forecast but that means you have to be in the air for 10 hours from right from start to finish um when actually you might think it's a really really good day so uh and then obviously looking at cross-country speed so this gives a good indication of when you should launch so if you look at 10 a.m in australia um most of the country it's completely unsorable uh, the temperatures aren't high enough to produce thermals that's 10 30 and yet still not quite developed to 11. a lot of the country is still not sorable we're looking for like a pale orange that's when i'd like to recommend launching on a normal cross-country day 11 30. So this area of green and blue, that's where all the flooding's been. So it takes a long, long while for um, for the day to actually get going there. Um, so usually it's just sort in the mid afternoon this year. So around 12, 1230, that's where a lot of the country becomes sorable. Um, so yeah, if this is the UK, I'd launch around then. And then you'd look to see when the day cuts off still going really well three o'clock five o'clock um up to 6 30 so yeah this is the uk i'd go right i've got a window from 12 i want to be back at about six and then you can start looking at a route to plan into so thermal strengths this is also very interesting So zoom down. So narrow mine. This is like one of the most famous clubs in Australia. Um, the conditions there are very uh, homogenous. So uh, if it's good in one one area, it'll be good across a 500 kilometer area. So there's not too much to really look at. But if it was the UK, there'd be completely variable conditions, and you basically plan your flight to stay within the greens and the yellows. You know the top thermal strength bands um, and the height of the thermals so I take a quick look at that and then look at the cloud base and again forecast into the best the best looking cloud bases um, and on SkySet they have this really really useful feature where you can click route forecast and you can basically just drag out what you think um, the you know your your best task would be, and it even gives you options up at the top here. It gives you suggestions of what triangles or distances you should do. So green is like um, easy level, so one out of three. The yellows are two out of three, so medium difficulty, and then the reds are the the most difficult task you can try. So I think that's really cool as well. Um, and you can overlay airspace, um, a satellite pictures, and you can even get webcams for all the different gliding clubs around. So um, if you don't have SkySight, I'd heavily recommend it because um, the capabilities you can do on this, I mean, it's all you really need to be able to forecast the day. Um, it just has everything all in one platform. So I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, Having said that, it's always good to have lots of different uh, options for weather forecasting because um, SkySight gets it wrong some days. RASP is really good on others. So it's always good to cross reference with more than one gliding forecast. So um, within the UK, I find uh, a guy called Dave Masson. 
from Lasham. He's uh, a top, top weather forecaster. And across the summer, he's always producing forecasts on all the best days. And he doesn't just forecast for Lasham. He forecasts for the whole of southern England, really. Um, so for like a five minute browse in the morning, um, as you're having breakfast or whatever before flying, it's always good to just have a check. Um, this is one from the summer. Um, if you remember that crazy, crazy week in August, where every single day, I think it was along the task week, every single day was incredible weather. Um, and yeah, he forecast that all perfectly. So um, yeah, he's a very capable forecaster. Um, and I use him really, like quite a lot for my flying. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of Wendy as well. So I use this for all of my wind forecasting. Um, it's always very accurate. Um, and yeah, it just sort of shows um, like if there's like an easterly or a northeasterly wind, uh, you'd look at Windy and sort of stay well away from uh, sort of the Norfolk area, looking at sea air and that sort of thing. Um, and Sid's weather. George, is that good at forecasting emergencies? Windy? Uh, mm. Yes. So uh, it's not like SkySight where it'll give you like a big red line for convergence, um, but it will show, I don't know if I, where I can see any convergence. Uh, yeah, but if, if there was a sea breeze convergence set up, it would show like the sea air pushing in and the normal um, sort of westerly wind. And yeah, it is useful. I think it's useful for highlighting where there may be convergence in a day and then going over to SkySight to see exactly where the location of the convergence is and mm -hmm. where it will set up and how it will move during the day. I find that useful. Um, Sid's weather is really, really good. Um, so he has, it's at Nymphsfield, um, which is fairly far away from us. But uh, in the summer, he gives these big circles of different regions around the UK. And one of them is sort of the East Anglia area. So he does cover us. And again, he's just a very capable forecaster. He's done many a uh, um, a competition forecast, so um, he's really, really good as well. So, and then of course I'd use RASP. Um, so the main the main things I find useful in RASP is uh, looking at the convergence, seeing if it seeing if it matches up with SkySight, and Q uh, cloud base as well. It's very good. Um, so that's just the cloud base. Um, and then if if I'm doing any wave flying, RASP is particularly good at predicting wave conditions. Um, so it overlays the wind along with uh, vertical velocity. So uh, where are any wave bars will set up. Um, and another thing I've, I found really useful with RASP this year I hadn't used it before I started doing task week this year. Uh, you've got this thing called a meteogram, which you can find up at the top there. Um, and it just gives a really good sort of basic view of the day from a cross section point of view. So this was today. Um, there's so there's so much going on with it, it's kind of hard to interpret to begin with, but I'll try and give like a a small overview. So the gray clouds at the top here, this is like high cover. Um, the red here is buoyant air. So that's like the, the thermic air, you could say. With it, well, in the summer, that would be the thermic air. Um, and then where you have this light blue, that's the prediction for the inversion layer. So you can see at what height the cloud base will form. Um, and it has these snowflakes along the top. Um, just above the red, and that's the ice layer as well. Um, and then the clouds at the bottom here, this is low level cloud, and it has percentage of cloud cover. So you can really get like a detailed forecast just from like a one minute look. So I find that quite useful. I think that would be just as useful for training flying um, and just like a local soaring flight more than. Uh, cross-country flying, but I find that really good. 
so yeah that's that's what i do just to get my morning forecast done um any questions with any of that i mean there's quite a lot there so do you use satellite imagery at all george yes so windy again is really really good for satellite pictures so um so what you do you go to radar and satellite and then you've got weather radar and then you just click on satellite uh and then it gives it gives like a really good detailed version of all of the cloud cover and things uh and yeah it's all in real time as well which is nice obviously there's not much to look at uh right now but um i go we'll go somewhere more sorable and you'll be able to see yeah so this gives a good real world look takes a minute to load you can see where storms are bubbling up as well because um the whole like cloud just sort of explodes on all sides so yeah i i'd go to windy to look at my satellite pictures <coughs> Okay. Any other questions? George? Yep. Um, sorry, I've just sat down. What was the um, the sky site, the, 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 the one yeah. you were showing at first? So, yeah, just... just sky site, a... thank you. I'm making a sky note. Skysite.io, yeah, it's really, really good. Thank you. Um, no worries. Okay. All right, I'll move on with the rest of the presentation. That was just a quick overview of what I'd do on a morning. So, so yeah, looking at Wormford. So, and I'll go into sort of the site-specific weather, the weather that just affects us. And a lot of clubs don't really have to think about around the UK. A lot of this stuff gets neglected, really. Um, uh, and there's a lot that can sort of catch you out that we don't really think about. So, I think this is quite useful. So one of the things that we struggle with that a lot of clubs just take for granted is the easterly winds are a big problem for us. So it usually originates from a dry air mass, uh, which at least for us means we get quite blue conditions or at the least we get wisps. Um, so at Wellingford, um, this means a late start because the temperatures are really um, slow to heat up. And then an early finish as the sea breeze goes over the top of us. Um, I found we found that in the summer with the task week. Um, like we only had about a three hour, four hour window. I think it was on the Saturday, whereas everyone else in the UK had five or six hours just because of the wind slowing everything down. So And then that gives rise to the sea breeze effect. I'm sure we're all clued up on this, but yeah, just to give a quick overview. Um, late in the day, the um, high winds coming over the top of the cloud, you know, over the top of the inversion, the top of the cloud base, uh, that then descends down at the sea level, down to sea level, sorry, and then pushes a band of sea air into uh, East Anglia. Um, one of the things that often gets neglected is that wind strength is um, actually quite strong at ground level or for the for the level that the sea air comes in at. So between ground level and about 2,000, 3,000 feet, which means that if you're on final glide, say you're on final glide at Cambridge, you've got 40 kilometers to run and you've got 5,000 feet, you know, you'd be well on glide. The, uh, the UD calculator, the final glide calculator, it runs off your previous wind data from in the middle of the country. It doesn't, it doesn't calculate that you've got to go into a 15 knot headwind to get home. So something that's really crucial to think about is that whenever there's sea air forecast, you should take an extra 500 feet, maybe even a thousand feet on what you'd normally take. And then that can mean that you uh, definitely get on glide. I think a lot of people have fallen for that trap in the past. Um, so yeah, um, oh, another thing with the sea breezes is that in the middle of the season, it's at its strongest 
sort of that effect is at its strongest um, in sort of April, sort of March to March to May time. Um, the sea temperatures compared to the land temperatures aren't actually that much in contrast. So this is from April last year. Uh, this is like a very typical look. And the land temperature is 10 degrees. The sea surface temperature was five and a half degrees. So that's only four and a half degrees different. Whereas in August, oh sorry, July here, the land was at 24 degrees and the sea surface at 16. Uh, and that, I think a lot of people have seen that that means that small contrast or the increase in contrast means that we get a much more powerful sea air effect. So it comes much further inland and generally get more active sea breeze fronts in the middle of the season. Uh, another thing that uh, doesn't really get talked about much is the ground conditions. So um, flying from places like Lasham and Nymphsord and things, um, the ground's generally a bit wetter on that side of the country, especially earlier on in the season. Um, whereas in East Anglia, we get really nice dry ground in the summer. Um, and that generally leads to us having smooth thermals, uh, some of the best cloud bases in the country once you get inland to sort of Cambridge area. Um, and the thermals actually last for a long time. So um, in sort of the west, you know, the west of England, um, the thermals may last, you know, five minutes and they're just quick, like quick bubbles. Uh, and you can come underneath another glider and not have a thermal. Whereas I find in East Anglia, they're, they're really good at um, giving thermals that you can, you know, you can come to a turn point, go back in, and the thermal is still there. So that's generally good. Uh, another thing is wave effects. So even though Wangford's a long, long way away from the Brecon Beacons, Snowdonia, those areas, I think, well, I've had a few days where um, thermals just haven't been where they should be, and they're all square and skew iffy, or the streets are running in the wrong directions to the wind, uh, and that's generally due to the wave um, moving in completely opposite direction. Um, so this generally has a negative effect. So we have more sync between thermals uh, and the conditions are a lot more varied uh, and the thermals are very broken compared to normal days as well. Uh, another thing, spread out. So um, we usually get spread out within sort of March to May time. That's when you're mo well, we're most likely to have spread out. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we've all seen this where the, the cumulus starts popping at 8.30, 9am. And then very quickly, it just um, all um, rises up to the inversion layer uh, and then just spreads out into one big layer. So let you read that. So all it does is just stop the sun heating the ground, which completely cuts off convection. And uh, in half an hour, an hour's time, there's no thermals. And then you have to wait for a recycle. So the time of year has a big impact on uh, the best cross country days. So um, you, we usually get some really nice days in March, but the sun's so weak uh, and the days are quite short that we only really get a two or three hour window in which to go cross country. So that makes it a bit more tricky. Um, in the past couple of years, April, May has been really nice. Um, but we have problems to spread out. Uh, and the atmosphere is generally quite unstable around this time. So uh, any sort of difference in temperature from forecast uh, or dew point, and you can get a really, really nice day or a complete spread out and no cross country possible. So that time of year, it's really important to to keep an eye on the forecast and see whether the actual weather matches up with it. So over June to August time, that's when generally the forecasts are most accurate, I found. The days are really long. 
the atmosphere is really stable uh, and we get really good cloud bases. Um, and yeah, it's generally the best time to go cross country, as we all know. Um, and again, September can have really nice days, but again, they're short because the, um, the, the cycle. Um, but yeah, we can still have a really, really nice window in the middle of the day. So how to approach those variable days, those really tricky days where it's constant, it's a constant battle with the weather uh, and the route you plan. So uh, it gets referred a lot to as gear changing days because you're constantly going up and down through speed, cruise speed, sorry, uh, trying to match the weather, not really understanding what the right speed is to be going along at. Um, it does sound obvious, but you have to set your flight to maximize the nicest area, even if that's a small, a small area because of overdevelopment. Um, I like to do uh, my my favorite task these days are like a big bow and arrow, uh, sorry a bow tie, sorry, um, just so you can stay in that middle bit um, when there's overdevelopment all around, um, and try to fly in areas likely to overdevelop earlier on in the day. Um, cause obviously they get convective quicker, which is what causes the overdevelopment. Um, so you can squeeze a bit more distance in by taking off earlier and targeting those areas before the sun gets cut off. Um, but that, that can be risky. So you have to get that completely right. Um, and then obviously set the last leg up away from any potential sea air or those overdeveloped areas. Um, because later on in the day, the sun's not that strong. So if it's overdeveloped, it's less likely to recycle um, if you happen to be going through that overdevelopment. Uh, the overdevelopment, sorry. Um, and airspace can be a big issue if there's a lot of variable weather and you're just trying to stay up airborne. The last thing you want is to have airspace stop you routing how you'd like to be. Um, so it's always good to sort of stick away from sort of Dunstable area where you have the really low TMAs or the um, military areas, so Lake and Heath, Milton Hall. Um, so yeah, it's best to just keep in an area where you can on, you can always dive off to one side and make big routing decisions. Uh, right, so tephagrams. So with my degree, I do a lot of reading of tephagrams um, and I don't think many people really understand them. Um, so it's always good to, to really know how to read them because they give a lot of information, which I don't think you get from other data. So this is again, New South Wales to, uh, from yesterday. Um, so the basic theory of a tephagram, you've got the top of the atmosphere, uh, at the top of the y-axis uh, and the heights are all in hectopascals from uh, top to bottom being the top of the atmosphere to ground level and the green line is dew point temperature the red line is uh, like normal temperature and the blue line is wind speed in knots and the barbs on the on the other side that's all the wind that's all about the wind direction so um so for yesterday um george, on, sorry george sorry to gone. interrupt is it just me or is everyone suffering the bottom axis the x-axis being chopped off in the in the share uh what can you see um i can see down to 800 hectopascals no, i think it's i think i think it's just you mike i can see it okay okay I'll, I'll shut up then. I'll just put up with it. Uh, let me have a look. I can do. Is that any better? Yeah, that's that's better. I can see the exact. Okay. There. okay so uh, here we are. So um, the for nine a.m. the dew point and the actual temperature are quite close together. Um, so that means there's little surface heating. So in gliding terms, it's the very start of the day. The atmosphere is not mixing to produce any thermals, and um, like as a second uh, look at that, if you look at the wind speeds on the right-hand side, um, 
the wind speed at ground level is only nine knots, whereas at the inversion, it's at 30 knots. So that gives us uh, an indication that we've got a really strong inversion. Uh, so the atmosphere is nowhere near ready to produce thermals um, for launching to happen. So that's quite often the case in mainland Europe and sort of Australia, South Africa, these sort of areas where you have a really strong inversion in the morning and then you don't get going until sort of early afternoon. Um, we find that whenever there's like a high pressure system, that it takes a long, long time for the ground to heat to then produce thermals. So at 12 a.m., um, sorry, 12 p.m., the inversions weaken significantly. Looking at the wind, uh, it's more of a straight blue line. So the wind strength is the same throughout the whole of the bottom of the atmosphere, which means that it's mixing up between uh, the inversion layer and the bottom and the ground level. Um, and the dew point and temperature are starting to separate uh, at the inversion layer, which means that uh, cloud base is rising quite high or quite significantly. Um, so the um, with the wind barbs on the right hand side, can you see they're all pointing in an easterly direction? They're all moving in the straight in the the same direction. If they were all over the place, then that would indicate a lot of wind shear, so thermals would be broken. Uh, and we have that a lot in the UK, where you can tell how smooth the thermals are on a day by how much those wind barbs are moving near the ground level. So that's always something to keep an eye on. And then at 3 p.m., uh, the atmosphere is really well mixed. So that is that, that's what I'd say is the perfect looking tephagram. So the red line at ground level is really, really far from the dew point, the green line. Um, and then they both follow a really nice straight line up to the inversion, which means the atmosphere is really nicely mixed. Uh, and producing smooth thermals. Um, and you don't want those, you don't want the green and the red line to hit each other because that means that the atmosphere is completely saturated uh, and the humidity is 100%, which would mean that you'd have a apes cloud and there'd be no sun getting on the ground. So you want a small bit of separation between the green and red line at the inversion layer. Uh, are there any questions on tephagrams? Uh, it's quite sort of content theory heavy, uh, theory heavy there. So. Okay. George, where do we find them from? Um, so this is from SkySight. Right. You, I'll show you. I'll show you a few places. So um, if you go to SkySight and then click Point Skew T, this is really good because you can search up any area of the UK. They don't just do um, certain locations. You can click and point really. So um, this is from narrow mine. So you just point and shoot. Um, and then it gives you an interactive skew T diagram. It's really cool because you can um, move it around uh, and find the inversion layer. So here, this is where the red and the green line are the closest. So that's the inversion. And then you can move it across the left hand side uh, and see that the inversion is at around 6,800 feet there. Um, so it's very interactive. Alternatively, you can go to RASP. Um, and then click on soundings. The sounding is the same as uh, a skew T diagram. Uh, and then that just gives you certain locations yeah you've got a few to choose from in the uk so our nearest would be cambridge if i'm not mistaken and you can change your time through the day so as you can see here um the temperature and the dew point are really close together so as we had today completely saturated air wall to wall eight apes hopeless <laughs> um Yeah, that's tephagrams. Any other questions? 
George, how, how do you um, <clears throat> um, use this to work out what it's going to be later in the day? Um, so if I go to, uh, so for later in the day, I'll, I'll go back to SkySight. So this is for the second. So say you want to see when convection stops. Um, let's go for 6 p.m. Look, so at this point, you can see that the temperature and dew point are touching. And this gray triangle here means complete overdevelopment. So you can generally see the end of the day by, um, by looking at the soundings up to 6 and 6.30. Um, that. Takes a long while to load. So. <laughs> But the basic principle is you can use it to work out when things are starting to weaken off yeah and so, when it's going to start to overdevelop yeah so it either goes one of two ways um you get <coughs> overdevelopment at the end of the day uh, and the temperature and dew point come together or they completely spread apart um and the inversion starts dropping back down again and once the inversion starts to drop um then you can see that conditions are starting to tail off uh, and the thermals are getting weaker. Um, see if I've got it loaded. I'll come back to that. Um, okay, so as a summary, um, I've got eight, I've, I've picked out eight ingredients in the UK that make for an exceptional cross country day. Um, so I went on the ladder and looked at all the best days this year uh, and picked out all of the weather parameters that made them so good uh, and basically just made a list. So if there's five or six of these um, ticked off, then chances are we've got a really nice looking day. So this is your sort of classic uh, UK setup that means like a really good week ahead. So we've just had a low pressure system going through. So that I've put some letters on here so you can see what's what. Um, so it'd be the low pressure systems moving off into Scandinavia. And A, which is us, we just had the cold front move through. So if this was 9 a.m., we'd have a fairly brisk northerly wind to start the day and a low cloud base. But as the high starts to come in across Wormingford, then conditions would quickly improve uh, and we'd probably get a nice sort of late afternoon soaring window. Um, at E, F and G, um, this is the weather that we're going to get in the next few days. Um, and where um, the isobars start to spread out and push, push to the north, that's called ridging. Um, and that's exactly what we look for uh, to have a really nice uh, cross-country gliding soaring day. So um, we want the center of a ridge. So those ridges where E, for example, is, um, if they're right over the top of the UK, that means we've got a really good sign for soaring conditions. Um, so anticyclonic curvature is where they start to curve around um around the high pressure system and if that if that curving occurs over the top of the uk that's a really good sign for soaring conditions okay so um yeah so i made these sort of percentages the best days um and the percentage distance from the ridge so 10 to 20 percent is uh say like the low pr pressure system is 500 kilometers away the center of the ridge would have to be within 100 kilometers to then have sort of an 85 percent chance for 50 and 35 so a really good chance for soaring day if the center of the ridge is right over the top uh, so if the center of the high pressure 
is over the top of the UK. Again, that's that's also a really good sign. Um, yeah, these are just some stats. So um, it's interesting. If it's right over the top, it can mean that it's too stable to have a good cross country day. So it's actually is actually a good sign. The high pressure system is out to the west. Um, so on here, if, it's, if the high pressure system is out here in the west where F and G are, um, that's probably the best chance of having a good cross country day. And yeah, as I was saying about this, the anti-cyclonic curvature. So the high pressure system, the uh, isobar lines curving around. Um, that is almost essential to get a good day. So generally, if the pressure lines are curving away from the low pressure system, as you can see here, uh, then that's a really good sign, as they are. Um, and another thing we really like is uh, and like a northerly flow of air. So if we have a polar air mass, then that means that it will be dry, unstable air, which is exactly what you want. Um, usually, if it's come from a southerly or a southeasterly direction, i.e. from the continent, uh, that's moved across uh, the Atlantic, it's from the maritime, uh, and that will mean sort of moist, overdeveloped air. Um, so, yeah, we want dry, unstable air from northern latitudes like we have there. Um, another thing that's really sort of essential is the wind at 3,000 feet to be less than 20 knots. That's sort of a rule. Uh, unless you unless you have a, um, a high performance glider with water that can push into the wind, it makes it really difficult to make progress, especially from Wormingford where uh, with that wind, you'd be pushing into the wind first. Um, I'm sure we've all had it where we're just struggling to get away from from this side of the country just because the wind's so strong. Um, so about 12 knots at 3,000 feet is perfect. Um, and then the temperature spread. So uh, I looked at it here and about 12 to 13 degrees between the night minimum temperature and the daily maximum temperature is the perfect um, it's the perfect amount of difference to get a really nice looking cloud base um, but the air to be unstable enough to have a good cross-country day um, so we use the rule of night minimum uh, and day maximum the difference between them times by 400 and that gives the approximate cloud base uh, and then pressure so we want sort of that um, 1017 to 1031 so just pushing into high pressure um, that's the perfect uh, pressure levels to get a good day so it's interesting between 1022 to 1025 there's as high as 40% chance of having a good day so that's the low pressure moving off to the to the east uh, and then that high pressure just starting to move in before it becomes too stable george i think you've got a question from george green okay yeah yeah george the ridging that you talk about in the previous slide and this one um is that what sort of keeps the lid on the vertical development of the cumulus um yeah so Ridging in itself, um, that is uh, descending air, um, which sort of seems counterintuitive, but for a good soaring day, you need um, descending air of the whole atmosphere, which, as you say, keeps the inversion uh, fairly strong. So we don't have like mass massive vertical development once the cloud starts to form at the inversion layer it's not allowed to go really high up into the atmosphere um, and sort of spoil the day. So that's where, yeah. sorry, go on. 
so they're the days where you see nicely spaced cumulus not getting too tall yeah so that would be your sort of quite shallow looking cumulus nicely spaced apart um and the winds wouldn't be too strong because those isobars are fairly spaced out yeah, okay. Thanks, George. No worries. So yeah, that's I'll go back to the summary. So that's the eight things that we look for. Um so yeah, it might be useful to have like a list of that whenever you're looking at other forecasts and sort of tick each one off as you go along. And chances are if you've got at least five of them, you'll have a good day. And if you've got seven or eight of those. And it's probably an exceptional day, one of you know one of the best days of the year. And they're the ones to target. So that's what makes a really good gliding forecast. Um, George, when you talk about dry air, yeah, how dry is dry in terms of relative humidity? Um, so you'd be looking for sort of that 30, 40 percent humidity. So when we look at the tephogram, you want those red and green temperature dew point lines to be fairly spaced out um, so you don't have like, masses of saturated air. Right, thank you. No worries. Okay, yeah, so that's sort of the basis of gliding weather in the UK. Um, and the, there's I've touched on a bit around Wormingford as well and all the issues we have. Um, and I've got a picture there of a really nice looking sea breeze front uh, from one of the days, I think last year. So, yeah. Any questions? And George, the, the, the links to those sites, is it possible that you can circulate those to us yeah. later? Yeah. So, um, what I did is made a bookmark. So, you can just go on your browser and click on the bookmark and then it brings up all the tabs uh, and then you get like a, a big list of all of the websites and you just click on each one and it takes you directly so uh, I can share that with you and then you just have to add it to, to your browser and then you're you're ready to go. That's great thanks and would you be happy if we um, were to circulate the slides to the club members that attended yeah. the talk? Yeah. So I find that a lot of people find meteorology and weather to be generally a very sort of dry topic um, and one that's difficult to take in. Um, so I think it's good to, to sort of look over these sort of things I think generally a couple of times. So yeah, I'd be more than happy to share them across. Right, thanks George. And um, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have a a winter talk on the weather is just how um, we can build our own appreciation of the situation rather than just simply relying on RASP or SkySight to tell us mm. that we actually understand some of the principles of what makes a good soaring day. So I think that's that's come across really well for me. I really like your eight summary, your mm -hmm. page of eight key points to look for. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're great because you can look at the surface pressure chart um, and make your own assumption of the day before you even look at the forecast um, based off those ingredients. And then you can start to make a, um, a, you know, your own interpretation uh, of gliding weather um, and just generally get better at forecasting yourself before then looking at looking at sky site and rasp sort yeah of there's, there's, there's been lots of days where i've looked at rasp and it's not worked out as rasp forecast um mm. so i think i think it, it's good to to have that sort of personal resilience that you can can look at uh, uh different um, sites but um silvano's got a question i think yep. uh, he wants yeah. to ask yeah Go george ahead. hi hi george do you ever look uh at any moving maps or so or forecast during a flight let's say you are three hours and things change a lot and you think oh i must have a look what is going on or do you never ever look um so 
I wish I could. Um, I, I know a few people that um, have some really nice weather overlays. Um, yeah, I, I don't personally, but I will be from next year. Um, it's things like top cover, so like the high level Cirrus. Um, if you can have that displayed on your moving map, um, it's really um, difficult to actually know exactly where it is looking up at it from the glider. But if you have a top down satellite picture, you can get a really good idea of how fast the top cover's moving, where it's moving from, and how it's actually going to affect you. Um, so I'm going to have that overlaid next year. Whilst I'm flying along, I can look at it on my moving map. Uh, another thing is like a rainfall radar. It's a really stormy day, uh, and you're not sure like where your path back to the club is. Uh, if you can see like the rain radar screen, you can start to like make a route for yourself uh, rather mm. than looking for a like a mess of haze and rain. There so what equipment have we all got to go out and buy to get to see that then? Um, so on the UDI, uh, on the standard UDI, if you get a CU license uh, and a SkySight license, I, I'm pretty sure you can overlay um, the the features through SkySight. Um, okay. So I, yeah, I think that's possible. Um, you can find out how to do that in the manual. I think it's in the UDI manual. Um, it's quite a new thing though. Um, hmm. hasn't really been developed uh, since I think, a year ago or two years ago. So, um, yeah, but they're they're very useful. Yeah, I think it takes the fun out of it a bit. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> George, how far ahead do you start tracking a promising day? Um, so this is where I find looking at Sawmet and Dave Masson's forecast because he'll get interested being like a key meteorologist. He'll get interested maybe five days out from a really good day. Um, so I just constantly keep updating myself with that every other day or so, you know, like a two minute browse every morning. Um, and if he's getting really excited about it, then I'll start taking an interest myself. Uh, and looking at how sky is like developing things. Yeah. Um, and how, how much do you use the surface pressure chart as well to start tracking a, a promising potential day? Um, so they, I think they forecast three days out um, and they're generally quite accurate. Um, so just seeing whether the, so if you have a cold front sweeping through and then the next day it looks really, really nice just making sure that cold front is moving at the speed it's forecast to move at. It's those sort of things that can very quickly either ruin a day or make it one of the best days of the year. Just by checking that the weather is moving exactly how it's forecast to three days ahead of time, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, you, using the like professional meteorologists within gliding I think is one of the best things you can do um, because they've done it for 40 50 years I think the the thing of meteorology is experience counts for everything uh, and these people know the sort of forecast to look out for um, and they I, I don't know there's there's this weird thing where people can just tell whether the weather's going off the boil or if it's looking really nice just based off experience so um it's really good to to follow them the the forecasters right thanks thanks george well um is there any other questions has anyone got any other questions they want to put to george not well, okay. the off the subject uh, do you have do you find it much easier flying from Lashen than flying from Wormingford? Um, no, I don't actually. Um, so Lasham has, uh, its own issues and problems. Um, I mean, we have the airspace issues trying to get out of Stansted, um, and tracking North, whereas they have issues trying to get through Farnborough, um, and then Gatwick and Southampton and those areas and 
Fryers Norton to the northwest. Um, and when the weather's really tricky, um, Lasham has issues with the, um, uh, the, the ground to the west being really sort of wet and damp and um, difficult at the start of the day. Um, so it can be tricky to find a route out right at the start of the day. Um, whereas I think one, if it gets going in a like in a southwesterly direction, it's a bit quicker to get going. Um, and you have like a crosswind to get out of the well, out of the area. So um I think they're about the same really. Um yeah, I wouldn't say one's easier than the other. They both have their own challenges. What do, what do you, what do you think about um, sea, the sea air issue, George? When you're tasking from Wormingford, um, um, how how do you plan your task in relation to the sea air? So what what I like to do is to start my cross country flight by sticking sort of to the east, because um, that's usually the area that gets going a bit quicker. Um, sort of tracking up towards Lake and, Hill, Lake and Heath and Mildenhall. Um, and you look out to the west and it's completely blue. Um, and that area still needs an hour to get going. So it's an easy way to bank in um, some kilometres right at the start of the day. Uh, and then obviously you can escape out to the west after that, once that area's got going. Um, knowing full well that the sea air is starting to creep in at the east. Um, and then once you're on your way home, coming back from sort of Northampton, Cambridge area, um, you know you've got that um, increasing headwind with the sea air coming in, like a stronger easterly wind. Um, so I always take more margin coming onto final glide. Um, yeah, I'd always go sort of straight north or slightly northeast, uh, depending on the forecast, obviously. Um, you you yeah. route into Norfolk generally earlier in the day, and then head west. Yeah, generally, that, I think that's if if you're thinking of like a westerly um, wind, like a standard westerly wind, knowing that sea air is coming in later on in the day. Um, I track out to the north, and then escape to the west away from the sea air, so I know that I'm coming into pretty good air until I get maybe 20 kilometers away from mine from 30 kilometers away where it's always best to stay high and then come back on on glide um, that's how I'd always approach it thanks I think silvano has got another question yeah yeah with seafront business sea breeze business um, do you ever bet on a seafront you can ride? like the opposite or can you spot one and say oh i'm down in no time from yeah along the seafront yeah it's difficult um so i think the sky sight and rasp are getting better or oh, they're constantly getting better at convergence forecasting um it's sort of a dark art though um i've tried it a few times and what generally happens is you set the turn point uh, say Tibbenham to then ride a sea breeze front down the coast and get home by that point the sea air has already gone through Tibbenham and you're having to go into the sea air and then come back out uh, and then there's you know there's a front that you can ride but it's difficult to know the exact location um, and it depends on the rest of your flight going really smoothly as well um, but yeah it's it's quite a fun idea it's to quite a high to risk strategy it. yeah yeah, to just ride a front all the way home. But yeah. I've only managed it twice. So. But it is good fun when it happens. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you very much, George, for your um, put, putting in the effort that you've put in to produce these slides and, and the talk for us. That's much appreciated. And no uh, also just to extend congratulations to you on behalf of the club for your selection for the British Junior team. Thank you. Um, I Sorry, um, um, Adrian, can I ask a last question from the floor? Yes. It's Clive it. here. George, which came first to you, meteorology or gliding, or was it the other way round? Hmm. 
Good question. Uh, so I started gliding uh, and then I did my bronze papers and instantly got hooked on meteorology. <laughs> no. Um, so I started going cross country um, and yeah, just really enjoyed looking at the weather through my cross country flying. Um, and then I took more of an interest to like big storm systems and uh, great big like American um storm and that sort of thing um and thought it'd be a really sort of interesting thing to study at university so oh brilliant um, there, there's some some of it links back to gliding weather but a lot of it is sort of large scale um weather systems um at university so um but yeah there are links back which is quite nice thank you thanks right. george Thanks, and um, hopefully we'll see you back at uh, Wormfield at some point during next season. Yeah, um, I'm back next weekend, back home, so uh, I'll probably be around the Christmas time, so hopefully I'll Good. bump into you. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you might be around to help us set some uh, tasks for the task week again. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, hopefully you have the same weather. Cause, well, um, yeah. we all have, have that. some more rest days. <laughs> I'm sure normal yeah. normal service will be resumed next year, George. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Depends if we do it in August or not. It's always that first week of August. <laughs> right. Well, th thank thanks again, George. And uh, yeah, best best of luck with all your studies. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, George. Well done. Yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone. If you like this video, then please click the like button below. Why not subscribe to the Essex and Suffolk Gliding Club channel by clicking the subscribe button and then click on the bell so you get notified when new videos come out. For more details, find us on Facebook or visit our website at esgc.co.uk where you'll find information on flights, lessons and club membership.